Today's topic is how to stop Donald Trump, but I want you to know first off that we're not going to talk trash about Donald Trump. We're not going to talk about his hand size or his necktie sales prowess. We are going to talk about Donald Trump as more of a case study in how the power of delegates plays out at the Republican convention. Now, some folks in this room might be feeling the burn and might be pretty upset about how those superdelegates are keeping Hillary Clinton's delegate count way up. And you might at the same time be thinking, man, I wish the Republican Party had something like a superdelegate <laughs> to, to prevent a Donald Trump presidency. And that's totally OK. Again, today we're talking about how this all plays out. The three topics are sort of the three parts here are number one, we're going to talk a little bit about who the delegates are and where do they come from. And then we're going to talk about two different scenarios, two different ways to stop a Trump nomination as the GOP presidency. And remember, again, he's just a case study. You can insert the word Ted Cruz. You can insert, <laughs> you can insert John Kasich. You can insert Donald Duck. It doesn't matter. The point is there are ways on the Republican side to keep, the, uh, to keep someone from becoming the nominee, right? Okay, so the first thing you should know about delegates is that they are not the Illuminati, right? <laughs> they are not this secret society of Opus Dei who gets together and decides the fate of the country. No, they are super normal, fun people. These are actual Texas delegates from 2012, and they showed up every day to the convention, a ton of them, of course, dressed exactly alike. It was kind of embarrassing, but so fun. But they're super normal, fun people. How many people here have any, has anyone here ever been to a convention, a political convention? See, normal, nice people here. Have you been delegates? Anyone been a delegate from a convention? There you go. Again, normal, nice people. Okay, so um, in order, th so remember though that when we're voting for people, when we're voting in primaries and caucuses, what we're basically doing is voting for delegates. We're saying, hey delegates, here's how you gotta go vote. In South Carolina, for example, Donald Trump wins, all 50 delegates in South Carolina have to go vote for Trump. What's important at a convention is what the delegates do, not what you and I do. The popular vote is not relevant at a convention, only those delegates. And that's a cartoon of Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft fishing for, <laughs> fishing for delegates off a pier in a very contentious 1812 election uh, cartoon. I love that you nerds get that. I'm sorry, oh sorry, 1912, 1912, see? God, <laughs> that was a test, you all passed, okay. So, uh, so who are these delegates and who are they loyal to? About 200, I'm sorry, um, 600 of them are picked by the candidates or approved by the candidates. Now, for Democrats, they're all approved by the candidates. But on the Republican side, there's only a little less than 600 who are actually approved or chosen by the candidates. And California is one state where candidates approve the entire slate of the delegates. So when we talk about where the, what are the loyalties of these delegates, only less than 600 are actually sort of true believers, or have the stamp of the candidate's approval on their delegate status. 200 of them are either party leaders or chosen by like party executive committees, right? This might be termed the dreaded establishment people. Uh, and then all of the rest, like 1,700 other people, like the vast majority of people at this convention, these guys are, uh, the national convention are, are chosen at the local and state conventions, right? This is super important. 44 states either choose all or some of their delegates at a state convention. So let me give you an example of here's some folks. This is a list and why Delaware, this is a list of Delaware's, uh, Delaware's delegates to the 2012 election. And why Delaware, it's a small state, there weren't very many delegates. <laughs> and I could find the list pretty easily. So if you look at these folks, here you see Board of, board of Education members, commissioners, right? We're talking about local folks who uh, either volunteer for the party, they give money to the party, they're, they're local officers to the party. But if you look there at the bottom for Thomas, Thomas there is a Ron Paul supporter. And um, in 2012, Delaware went entirely for Mitt Romney. And that meant all those delegates, including our friend Thomas here, had to go to the convention and vote for Mitt Romney, right? This is what I need you to understand very, very carefully because this is gonna frame everything else. The delegates are not chosen to match the person they're gonna have to vote for. 
You can think one thing as a delegate and vote for another. Let me give you another example. Mitt Romney, of course, won his home state of Massachusetts in 2012, but 16 Ron Paul delegates got themselves elected at the state convention, and it was pretty embarrassing. It was not as embarrassing as like the Clint Eastwood talking to a chair thing, but it was like, it was still pretty embarrassing for Mitt for his home state to have these 16 Ron Paul delegates. So that's just, again, another example of how it is that a candidate can think one thing <laughs> and have to vote for another. These people, people who think one thing and vote for another are gonna be critical to any kind of sort of plan or idea that they're uh, of sort of changing the nominee of the Republican convention. All right, so the last thing you should know about the convention delegates is this. We don't know who they are yet, right? So the state conventions don't start until March 12th. They run all the way to June. So I can't tell you um, who these folks are, who they actually care about, as opposed to who they're supposed to vote for. Okay, so the reason we talk about these delegates, again, is because depend it's their actions that are going to sort of dictate whether or not Donald Trump ends up being the nominee. All right, so to recap, most delegates are chosen at conventions. Delegates not chosen by the candidates, so those party folks and the convention folks, don't have to love the candidate they're voting for. And lastly, we don't know who the delegates are yet. All right, so, that, so having that little background, we're gonna start with scenario one. Scenario one is the contested convention. Now this is what we talk about when we hear terms like broker convention, open convention. This is, if you're a candidate not named Donald Trump, this is your best hope, right? This is your only hope, uh, is this contested convention. Okay, basically what this means is Donald Trump shows up and he does not have a majority of the delegates he needs to be the nominee. It's like American Idol. The first round doesn't produce a winner. It's just fun, right? You just, you just do it. You enjoy it, but you're not actually going to find a winner. All right, so here's what happens. After that first round, nobody wins. Here's what people often fail to understand. Over a 1,000 delegates become unbound, right? So that means that that delegate who was like, eh, Ted Cruz, I got to vote for Donald Trump, that person's like free to now vote for Ted Cruz if they want. They're free to vote for Donald Trump if they want. They're free to, to vote for Beyonce if they want. As long as she's 35, she might not be. Anyway, she probably wouldn't take the pay cut. But <laughs> the point is, they, you don't have to necessarily bid on the ballot even to get all the votes. What we, what we are talking about is the prospect of thousands of people who can do what they want to do. And so we talk about, uh, we talk about it as a brokered convention. But that's the wrong, that's the wrong, <laughs> that's the wrong word. Broker convention sounds organized. It sounds like there's a grown up in the room who's doing this stuff. No, okay, like there's no Lyndon Johnson Republican who's like in a hotel room, like pulling the levers and figuring this stuff out. Broker convention is an aspirational thing and it is gonna be more like a total freaking mess. More like the last scene in Animal House when, <laughs> when there's like the marching band marching into a brick wall and like the, the, you know, things are on fire. Like this, thousands of delegates who can do whatever they want to do. And there's nobody really in charge who's brokering it. So I prefer open convention or contested convention. So understand this is going to be a nightmare and it is the best case scenario. Okay, this is, this is what these guys are trying to do. Okay, and so it's natural that you'd have a question. Your question would be, how likely is it that Trump is gonna show up to the convention without the number of votes that he needs, right? How likely is this contested convention? And here's the thing, if you take all of the primary votes and the caucus votes and you put them in one big bucket, right? So the total number of votes that have been cast so far, so far, Donald Trump has won 34%, Ted Cruz has won 29%, and Marco Rubio has won 21%. All right, so again, you're gonna do this 10 different ways and you're gonna come up with 10 different answers. But what I did is I plugged in these, these numbers to every single subsequent contest. And the answer is, by the date of the Republican convention, Donald Trump will have 1,477 delegates. And that is more than he needs to get the nomination. So I'm not saying it's, imp it's impossible to beat him. What I'm saying is, and that's not like a huge lead, that's not an impossible lead, but it's one of the reasons why we talk so much about Ohio and Florida, right? Is because if Kasich can win Ohio and Rubio can win Florida, you go a long way toward denying that majority 
And that's why there's you know all this money and all this attention on these two races. If Trump wins both Ohio and Florida, it is going to be an incredible backflip to prevent him from getting the nomination. It's almost guaranteed that he would. So it is, to some degree, there is a good chance. <laughs> uh, to some degree, there is a, there is, it's very, very possible that he's going to show up with the right number of votes to become the nominee, which brings us to scenario two. <laughs> okay, this is, Sarah two is the nuclear option. No one wants to do this, but I want to talk about what's possible, not what's probable, because what's possible can become what's probable <laughs> the closer we get to the convention. When the Republican Party has to weigh, do we blow up the party or do we just go ahead and let him become the nominee? But I just, from a rules perspective, I'm a strictly like technical perspective, I want to talk about what's possible here. This really, this scenario entirely depends on this. It entirely depends on people showing up to the convention who don't, who have to vote for Donald Trump, but who don't want to, right? So what that means is that Rubio and Cruz have to like infiltrate. They have to infiltrate all those conventions, all the local ones, the Sarasota County Republican Party, they have to do everywhere. They have to infiltrate all those conventions and get their people into the convention into the national convention where they can vote against Donald Trump. This is what I call the Henry VIII scenario. What this means, because what this scenario is, is this, before there's a vote, before there can be a majority Trump vote, the delegates agree to change the rules. Just like Henry VIII, I don't like the outcome, I'm fixing to change the rules. We will just start our own thing. That is why I call this Henry VIII. But because people don't understand at every convention, the delegates have to adopt the rules that are going to sort of govern the convention. And I'll give you an example. In 2012, and this is a tiny example. We're going to talk about a much bigger one. A tiny example is in 2012, the Republican delegates adopted a rule called Rule 40B. Okay, Rule 40B says that in order to be considered a presidential nominee, you have to get a majority of the delegates, not the vote, of the delegates of eight states. Now, this really did nothing more than prevent Ron Paul from being considered a nominee, right? And, and of course, the supporters knew it. And it was a big deal, and Ron Paul had won like 185 delegates, and he should have been, you know, the people should have been able to be on the floor casting votes for him. But to prevent that from happening, to keep like a unanimous Mitt Romney thing going, they passed Rule 40B, and that's just an example of a rule that you can pass that can disenfranchise a certain, a certain candidate. The chairman has a lot of power to take these kinds of motions from the floor and to make these changes. And what you saw was, uh, was a rule that would sort of disenfranchise about 180 folks. Imagine, imagine a, a contest where you were trying to change the rules to, change, to make sure that Trump was not the nominee. Imagine this times like a million and include like Trump supporters who are not all the most Restrained? <laughs> Restrained people? Um, like, this could be insane. Um, and so no one wants this to happen, right? Again, no, the party does not want this to happen. And in fact, they might actually prefer a Trump candidacy to this, to like 1968, Chicago, cars flipped over and burned in the parking lots. Um, and again, remember, it really requires Cruz and Trump, people who can't get, I mean, Cruz and Rubio, people who can't get themselves elected to infiltrate all of these local conventions, which, so that's a questionable proposition too. But assuming they could, assuming they could, this could happen. Now, this is a cartoon, again, from the 1912 convention, where uh, after which uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt formed his Bull Moose Party, having been on the, on the losing end of some decisions at the Republican convention. Based on what we know this year is that when it comes to politics, <laughs> anything can happen.